a gorgeous morning. You know, it's amazing how God works that out. Some mornings, you know, it's it's just so absolutely beautiful. And that's when we get our first hard frost, right? <laughs> but it's, uh, it, it is a gorgeous morning. And uh, uh, it's one of those mornings that uh, kind of makes you want to get up and get going, except I did notice something this morning. Uh, on my regular plan, and I try to be within five minutes of my trip. I was all the way to Dunville this morning before the sun came. <laughs> Hopefully it'll still be up when I get home today. We got we got a couple special things uh, that I'm going to share with you later on at the end of the service. Um, so with all that in mind, as soon as the bells have stopped ringing, we're going to raise our voices that we all believe in one true God, number nine hundred fifty-three. consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. Almighty God, merciful Father, and Holy Baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive our sins and grant us new life to your spirit. Be in our midst, enlighten our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. 
praise through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now speak responsibly of the entrails. <clears throat> the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he is the crushed in spirit. I will bless the Lord at all times. This praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and he delivered me from all my fears. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears, and he delivers them out of their trials. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and is now. The Lord is near to the broken heart and saves the crushed in spirit. <clears throat> this morning, we learned from our Old Testament lesson that we can never be satisfied with the things of this world. It is only when we understand that what we have is a gift from God, when we have plenty to be satisfied with. This is true in more ways than just physical abundance. It includes the desires of our imagination, the control of others, and the power of influence, I mentioned just the Old Testament lesson for this morning, is written for us in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verses 10 to 20. 
He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. So what profit have the owners, except to see them with their eyes? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of the rich will not permit him to sleep. There is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owner to his hurt. But those riches perish to misfortune. When he begets a son, there is nothing uh, in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. This also is a severe evil. Just exactly as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he who labors for the wind? All his days he also eats in darkness. He has much sorrow and sickness and anger. <clears throat> Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and, in, and enjoy the good of his labor in which he toils unto the sun all the days of his life, which God gives him, for it is his heritage. As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth, and given him power to eat of it, and to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, it's a gift of God. For he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life, because God keeps him busy with the joy of his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now we turn the second time to God. Even though the word of God cuts to the very depths of who we are, because of Christ, we can come into the rest for our souls that God desires for us. Second lesson for this morning is written for us in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, nor being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we have believed, who have believed, do enter the rest, as he said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place on the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Then again in this place, I shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying to David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, when he, uh, then he would not have, uh, afterward, have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also increased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and is a discerning of the thoughts and intents of the heart, and there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open in the eyes of him 
to whom we must give an account. Says the word of the Lord. I invite you now to rise from the hour of labor. Thank <laughs> you. 
Christ. And, and all this by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text that I have chosen to share with you this morning kind of ties in with the lessons that we just read about the things of this world and especially the things of God. It's from Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. Another parable Jesus put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while he slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced the crops, then the tears also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, The enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? And he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uplift the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather the tares and bind them in bundles and throw them and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. This is our text. It's a little while ago, but uh, I was reading a feature article in a magazine called Jews to Jesus. It, it's the uh, a story that really ties in with our theme, my thoughts for today. It seems that, that in this story, a group of, of Christians wanted to pray for Jewish people that they might learn to trust and believe in Christ. In the newspaper, an editorial said that Christians must abandon the idea that Jewish people should be converted. Two years later, Jews for Jesus came to town to reach out to their own. The clergy from downtown were outraged that Jews were reaching out to Jews for Jesus. We truly live in mingled fields of separate worlds. You ever thought about that? Mingled fields of separate worlds. That's exactly what Christ is telling us in this parable. Now we know a parable is a story with a heavenly meaning to it. And the parable, <coughs> <coughs> the setting for this parable is Christ in his hometown of Capernaum, teaching about the kingdom of heaven. And he's using parables more than he is just teaching uh, doctrine and uh, expounding the, the scriptures. You know why? Because it's just exactly as I've heard a thousand times in my ministry. <clears throat> Y'all understand this children's messages better than mine. And only one person caught that. <laughs> oh, but it's true. Because the children's messages are so much easier to understand. It's a nice little illustration. You know... We've got to understand that sometimes we need to expound the scripture too. Now, what's the purpose of this parable that Christ tells us? It's giving a picture of the kingdom of heaven as it relates to this world. And Jesus' hearers could understand this parable 
Because they knew that, that remember, most of the people who heard Christ were like you, ordinary, everyday people. Because the Romans were aloof and standing over there. They didn't care a twit about the Jews and their religion. The Jewish leaders were standing over there and they were already angry at Christ for teaching something that would interfere with their control and power over the people. And the people he spoke to could understand because they had enemies on both sides who wanted to keep them crushed and in their place and always under their thumb. Has anything changed? Does this parable apply to you today? Anybody on this earth today? Before I get too far into the, into the parable that I want to talk about, this morning I was watching the news. And this is a, a new story. But apparently a group of Christians had gone down to Haiti here very recently to do some mission work. And just this morning, the news broke that they have been taken prisoners. They've been captured by a gang down there. We really don't know where they are. We don't know how to get them free. Mangled fields. Separate worlds. We live in mingled fields. But you know what? Because we live in mingled fields, we have to live together. We have no option. We have to live together. We have to work together very simply because there are things that happen in this world that, that, that affect all of us. Be it a a natural disaster that comes upon the, this earth, like a, a hurricane or a tornado, or the, the light. <clears throat> when it comes to living in this world, we have to live and work together, no matter who we are or what we believe. That's just a given. And we must also do things together as a as a nation or as a group of people, especially if we come under an attack of one type or another. And I hearken back to Paul Black and 9 11, which is memory for all of us. We have to live in this mingled world. But what about spiritually? Have you ever thought about it spiritually in this mingled world, separate fields? You know, it's almost impossible. In fact, it's not impossible, but it's very difficult to bring someone into the faith who already <coughs> professes strongly the faith that they have. The number one growing religion in America today, and I think I've said this before, and all of us Baptists have been saying it for the last 20 years, is Islam. And many Christians say there's no way that we can or should reach out to, to uh, Muslims to bring them the message of Christ, to bring them the message of salvation, hope, and eternal life as God has, has presented it to the entire world and will carry it out in due time. But you know, there is a way to reach out. <clears throat> First of all, there's a common heritage for both the religions, Abraham. And because there's this common heritage for the two of them, then not only do we Christians believe in the word of God, Muslims believe in the word of God. And the word has come to them, they believe, through, the, through their prophet Muhammad, which he put down in, in his version of the Bible called the Quran. And, but the word is there. We have the word of God. As has been promised, down, all of us from the beginning of time, and the word, as we know the word of God, has become flesh lived among us, 
and has given us and shown us the only true God and way of salvation. So we have a starting point. We must do this. We must bring this this truth, this separate world to the mingled fields. We love it. As I share the Bible study with the <clears throat> with our Bible study group on Sunday mornings, it's called Christians in a Woke World. As we get just a little bit deeper into this Bible study, you're going to find out that there is only one answer to the crazy world in which we live. And it's the answer that I've just given you. It has to be that which actually motivates God himself, and that's love. And that's the answer, the only answer that we can give to our mingled world. And we do, and we must live separately. Wheat and tares are different. Wheat and tares are as different as pure water and salt water. They are as different as water and oil. Tares are not and can never be wheat. No matter what they look like. They may look the same as they grow together. They may look the same as they're mingled in the world in which we live. But they can never be wheat. No matter how many wonderful, great, and good things that they do for this world itself, God tells us that they're still tears. And they're still destructive. Especially when it comes to the things of truth and reality that God has given us. They can never be believers. Because the more that they do for the people around them or the thing that they do for the world in which they just drag themselves deeper and deeper and deeper away from and deeper and deeper into their unbelief. As though they are the same ones. Separate worlds made of fear. They cannot be the same, only from a different point of view. You see, there is no such thing as being the same from a different point of view. Now that does not say that what I'm talking about is different Christian denominations. Yes, we have a some Christian denominations have a different point of view from other Christian denominations, but we are the same in that we all believe and teach that there's only one Savior, Christ Jesus, and the only Savior of the world. Tears cannot be wheat because many of the tares live openly and outright as enemies of God. And they make no bones about it. They do not like wheat. They do not like to be with those who believe in Christ. In fact, their goal is to remove Christ from the face of the earth under whatever form that can be done. It can never be wheat. And wheat can never be tares. We can never become people of the world. If we do, or even if we try to, we run the risk of throwing what we have as the wheat that God is putting in his barn away. 
We run the risk of destroying the very thing that we are. We run the risk of becoming like the world. And then we truly ought to be criticized. That's you. Or we can never permit our children to be so influenced. Many adults are drawn away. Say nothing then about children being drawn away from true faith in Christ. Just some examples that work very, very diligently to draw all people away from Christ. Now back about 30 years ago when the term political correctness was being bantered about somewhat, I personally never took it all that seriously. Maybe because I felt and believed in my heart that there was a consciousness amongst the people, especially in our country, that this kind of nonsense would never be taken to heart or implemented. I was wrong. This stuff has really taken root. And it shows itself in so many other ways. You can't watch the news and even once without seeing some uh, parents at a, at a, uh, at a school uh, council meeting, at a school board meeting, without them there defending their children against some of the most evil teachings that would, that, that there's want to be put upon them from the school districts. And many of them are, are extremely dangerous for the very well-being of the children that they are to be teaching because they are teaching their children, teaching our children be the same way that Hitler used to teach the kids of Germany. Have you ever heard of the term of uh, Hitler's, Hitler's kids? I knew one. She was a war bride. And she told me one day that when she was a child, she became one of Hitler's kids. And she did some nasty things to her own family. And to kids that she grew up with that wouldn't conform to Hitler's world. My friends, that experiment is being used on our children. Maybe not here in the Barnesville School District or the neighborhood, but it is being used on the children of America. There's so many other things where we as the weak run the risk of becoming tears. You know, as Christ gave this parable, I thought about it. a children's illustration that you're all going to, you're all going to grasp right away. Right up here, I have a bag of pins. I just randomly reached into my coin collection and I threw pennies in this sack, in this, in this sandwich bag. Now, with this bag of pennies, used as the parable of the wheat and the tears, I have to make an addition. I don't know what's in that bag. Now, and with that being in the case, I really can't just reach in that bag and go out and start spending my pennies. Because you see, as I reach into that bag and reach in and start to draw spend, I might very well have some very valuable pennies in there. And if I were to reach in and grab one of those valuable pennies and go out and spend it for the value of a penny, I would be doing the very thing Christ is talking about, of mingling the fields. So I have to take this jar of bag of pennies to a, to a coin dealer so that he can go through these pennies one at a time and tell me which are just ordinary pennies and which are valuable pennies. Once I've done, he's done that, then I can separate the two and use them accordingly. That's the message Christ is giving us. 
as we live in different worlds. Our worlds are so separate. <clears throat> they are just like night and day. But we live in a maple field. Because we live in a maple field, we have been called on by Christ to work in that maple field in his name. To doing the things that he has for us according to the goodness that he gives us. And in the end, Christ will separate his fields. But if we so order our lives as we are the wheat of the world, then we can know that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, into eternity. Amen? Amen. Let's make ready to give our gifts to God. I invite you to rise for prayer. <laughs> As God's children, beloved of God, invited by Jesus to come to him without hindrance, let us pray for the church, the world, and ourselves, trusting the mighty mercy of our Lord, God of mercy, <laughs> for the church. Let the Lord deliver us from greed and and instead, turn our hearts towards generosity, showing love to one another in the world, and putting our time and talents into the seeking of the lost. God of mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> for those in our community, for the sick, those facing surgery or, or having terminal illness, even those who have lost loved ones, we now remember in our own hearts. Especially those who we recount that are in us, that are printed for us in our in, in our own public prayers for Don and, and Gail, Cheryl, for Paige, Barney, for Roberta, well, and, and for Kathy. Be with them, Lord. Strengthen them. Um, and keep them under your protective care as, as they recover and heal. That they might glorify your holy name in their hands. But there was one mis was spoken word that I gave for we we remember those who, families who have lost loved ones this past week. For Gregory Boyd, and especially for Ernie Swenson, our dear friend here, whom you called even unto yourself. Be with these families. Wrap them in your love. Care for them. Protect them and always. Let them know and be assured that all things are really okay as you are God and are with them. That they might receive mercy and healing according to God's will. That their hearts be open to receive the love of Christ. That they find peace in the love of Jesus. God of mercy. For our congregation that having received the mercy of Jesus, we find ways to bring God's mercy to the people around us. 
family, co-workers, friends, and strangers alike. We pray especially for children in vulnerable situations, those not yet born, those experiencing family division, those struggling with poverty. Show us a way to show these little ones mercy and open our arms to them as Jesus did. God of mercy. Let your Holy Spirit read the prayers of our hearts that remain unspoken and hear those spoken prayers in the mercy you show for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we now prepare ourselves to receive the Holy Son. The Lord be with you. Amen. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should, in all times and in all places, give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and, and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company in heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, everyone praising you and singing.
taken since Christ's true body to live to death for all of us. Taken with this is Christ's true body, shed for the remission of all of us. Now may this true body be one of our remote strength and preserve you in the true faith. And with time led to all eternity. Heart now live always for a sweet and also a sweet. Thank you. 